you ever date someone who's like really attractive, like way out of your league, and she knows it, and she treats you like crap, but you can't help it. You're not going anywhere else. You keep coming back for more. That's like my relationship with Marvel Comics. Because I got to go for free. So let's talk about Superior Spider-Man, guys. Uh, I haven't really been reading too much Superior Spider-Man, but I picked up the conclusion to the Superior Spider-Man run because I kind of wanted to see how it wrapped up, how they brought Peter back and everything. And I was pretty impressed. I actually really enjoyed the series. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about the last... I, I just... I started at... She's drinking too much rum here already. I started at 28. And I kind of went through 28, 29, 30, and 31. I got the variant here. This variant isn't great. But, uh... I don't know about you guys. I thought his crotch made me a little uncomfortable in the main cover. I don't know if you guys saw that one. I just... I didn't like what was happening there. He almost had a bit of a gunt happening. It made me a little uncomfortable. So I decided to just grab this one anyways. Superior Spider-Man wrapped up. Uh, very similar sort of Dan Slott storyline that I've read before, we've had before. He's really good at the sort of epic, the world is coming to an end. The odds are totally stacked against our hero. We just, we don't see any way that the hero can can figure out how to solve this issue. Uh, we get a lot of shots of what's going on around the city. You get cyborgs being hacked and taken over that are supposed to be defending people. that are taking over people. Uh, Doc Ock situation is just uh, everything that he's sort of built is being destroyed in front of him. And he's just losing his shit. He can't hold it together. He can't react. He doesn't know what to do when he's uh, lost control. Um, so we find out that Norman Osborn actually knows that that Dr. Ock has taken over Peter Parker and Osborn is pissed about this so he has a bit of a personal vendetta against uh, Superior Spider-Man because he want he wanted to be the one to kill Peter Parker and he's upset that he didn't get the chance to do that. He's gone and he's just everything that uh, Doc Ock has tried to build this, build this legacy that he's tried to build something better than he had in his previous life uh, the Goblin just systematically shuts down everything he cares about. People he's saved, he kills. People uh, like this medical center he's built, he's destroyed. Uh, everything from his past, his home, everything. He's just boom, 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 blowing it all down and uh, showing how much better he is than Superior Spider-Man. Um, and Doc Ock really has a hard time with this. Uh, his whole lair gets destroyed. Uh, he, he does his best sort of in reaction, but you see him stuttering and staggering. Uh, and then at the end, what ends up happening is uh, we see his girlfriend, uh, Anna Maria, is taken by the goblin and he doesn't know how to save her. He just realizes that he doesn't have what it takes to save her and he knows that Peter Parker does. So I think the real climax of this story is issue 30. Um... There's just, guys, a great dialogue between Superior Spider-Man and Peter Parker, uh, Doc Ock and Peter Parker, about uh, their relationships and who they are. Uh, I don't know if I want to say it. I'm going to say it because it's so good. So uh, I'm going to put a little spoiler line in the bottom. So mute until the spoiler's done if you don't want to read it. But basically what he does is he goes into how Dr. Octopus as, is so insecure because of his upbringing that he's always had to overcompensate and always had to talk himself up, make him seem like he's bigger, better, badder, smarter than he really is. Uh, and that's why he's called himself the superior Spider-Man. But he admits to Peter that because Peter's held so much guilt over the years, he does the exact opposite. He makes himself less than he's supposed to be. He shrinks himself down. He says he's not as smart as he is. He thinks he's not a, he can't do as much as he can. And that's what why Spider-Man or Peter Parker has always been sort of uh, behind on a lot of things. And the whole Peter Parker luck is really just this guilt that he holds on himself and he looks at himself as less than he is. And even though he has the ability to do so much more. So really cool dialogue that they have between there. And then the end of that, uh, Doc Ock admits, you know, you are the real superior Spider-Man. 
And honestly, I, I saw that coming from issue one. I had a feeling that's the direction he was going to go. Just because I know Dan Slott loves Spidey, and you know he's not going to like set up Doc Ock to actually be better than Peter Parker in the end. So I, I had a feeling that's kind of the direction where it was going. But it doesn't make it any less satisfying when it actually got there. So that was the real good climax. And then in 31, we see Peter Parker returning. This Really, you could make this... Uh, Amazing Spider-Man number one if you wanted because this is all Peter Parker but uh, and he's Peter Parker kind of does his thing Like we're used to and we sort of see where maybe things are gonna go a um, couple things about this issue there There was this little like afterwards uh, con Conclusion type thing between him and Mary Jane and their have relationship is colored really weird I don't know if you guys like have really stark shadows, which I just didn't think looked right where they were and how they were i guess because they were trying to set a tone but uh they should just move them to a different location if they want to do that because in the setting it looks really funny it's a minor thing i know really solid ending uh sort of predictable sort of dan slot feel story like i feel like i've heard this type of story from him a lot uh and it's kind of part of the reason i'm just ready for him to move on uh really excited actually about what he did and i think this is a really really important for Marvel Comics, and I think it's a really good thing. Now, even though I didn't really care about Superior Spider-Man, I want to read that story. Uh, it's just where I was at the time, and when I was reading, I just I didn't want to spend that money on the Doc Ock Spider-Man story. Uh, it was a huge risk for Marvel to take and to allow Dan Slott to tell that story, especially for a year. Uh, and I think the reason we, I, I predicted it was only going to go six months at the most, and it did really well, and people really seemed to connect with the story and enjoy it. And I think that's huge for the future of Marvel because that was, like I said, a huge risk. And hopefully they'll be able to take more risks like that and take more bold steps with their characters and move them in different directions and do different things. Because I think the reason, one of the big reasons in the 90s they were almost bankrupt is just because they weren't really doing anything new or exciting in terms of storytelling and taking these characters to different places. So uh, Dan Slott's really brought Peter Parker in some interesting directions and did a really great job, I think, with Superior Spider-Man, uh, from what I understand, from what I have read. Uh, even though it wasn't the story I wanted to read, I think it was really, really great for Marvel. And I'm really hoping in the future Marvel they're willing to do more things like this. Because I love it. I love it when they take these characters and do completely wacky, off-the-wall things. Uh, it's never permanent. You never lose out the character. What's important is that you keep the heart of the character there the whole time and do different things. And I think he really did a good job there. So... Hopefully, he'll have a little bit of a run here on Amazing, get it set up, and make his way uh, to move on. Also, quickly review that they had a Silver Surfer in here, so I'm going to review that. Uh, Silver Surfer, it was a clip out of the issue one, I guess. I thought it was the whole book, which is actually why I wasn't going to buy this at first, and then I did because I was like, oh, that preview's in there. I thought it was the whole story, like in uh, that Black Widow one they did. It's just, uh, it's just one part of it. But I really enjoyed it. Uh, if you guys like Doctor Who, which I've watched like four episodes and I like it. It seems like the kind of show I would really get into if I if I let myself. If you like Doctor Who, it's, it's got a really Doctor Who-ish feel, which I guess is what he's going for. Where uh, you're in the sort of the shoes of this companion girl that Silver Surfer brings to the galaxy. And he decides he wants to show her all these amazing things throughout the galaxy. And... So they start off going to one place to see something that Silver Surfer just thinks is amazing. And uh, it gets broken into a fight and different things happen, blah, blah, blah. And the end, kind of, sh the girl says, you know, I, I want to go places that you've never seen as well. Is there places that you've never seen? And Silver Surfer says, you know, the universe is so vast. Of course, there's places I haven't seen. So let's go there. So they're going to head out in that direction and have some cool intergalactic adventures. And I think uh, hopefully Dan Slott has the imagination to make some really neat stories, uh, just really out there type stuff, which I think could be a, a lot of fun. It's got a nice lighthearted tone to it. You have like shark pirates in this and stuff, which which I like. So, uh, you know, it's $3.99 and I'm really, I have issues with $3.99 books and it's Marvel, which I have issues with Marvel, like I was saying. Uh, I'm really a, often a lot quicker to pick up like a new image title or something like that. But I, I did enjoy it, so that might be going on the list. We'll see, because I've dropped a couple books lately. Uh, but I'm also adding Amazing Spider-Man as it's coming back to my list, so we will see. Uh, I should mention, 
uh, Amazing X-Men uh, number five came out. Brand new creative team. So I dropped it. Uh, remember last week I asked you guys, what do you think? Like, if you have a book in your pull list, do you have the right to ask them to put on the shelf? And a lot of you guys said, yeah, you think I have the right. Because I was talking about that Deadpool 999 book. And so I decided, you know what? Uh, I don't want to pay 399 for something that's a whole new team. Like I signed on because I like the Ed McGinnis story or art. And I like that, that story. And if you're just going to go ahead and throw a new team on me and you already have uh, the other Nightcrawler book, then I'm just I'm going to drop it. I'm not that interested. Uh, so yeah, so drop that one, just so you know. So because I had a light week this week, I decided to pick up this one, Iron Fist, uh, the living weapon number one. This guy, Care Kyle Andrews, is going to be at the Vancouver Fan Expo, which is tomorrow. I'm going to really excited. So I figured I'd pick it up. Check it out. If it was any good, I'd get it signed. I probably will bring this and get it signed. Uh, and the cool thing about getting this signed by him is he does everything in this book. He writes it. He does the art, the penciling as well as the coloring. So uh, the only thing he doesn't do is the lettering and the editing, obviously. So in the back of this book, uh, Kara Andrews talks a little bit about why he felt he wanted to do the whole book himself. And he talks about uh, Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. by, the, by Stranko. Uh, Nick Stranko and how he did the whole book himself and he was able to kind of take his vision and throw that all into this book and make it his completely and he's kind of wondering in there and querying like why has that changed why why does a penciler have to allow a colorist to come in and color uh, his pages maybe a different way than he would have liked and to that I would obviously say books are a lot more detailed and in-depth Stories are a lot more in-depth uh, and, frankly, higher quality than they ever were. And I think the whole bar has been raised over these generations as they pass, and it's continued to be raised. So, Karen Andrews, I totally applaud you for doing this yourself, and I think that's awesome. But I think one of the great reasons that you have teams doing these books and collaborations is because... Uh, a great writer and a great artist together makes a better product than a great artist who tells an okay story or uh, a great writer who draws an okay picture, if that makes sense. So, but still, I'm, I'm really impressed by him. I think you get a really cool thing when you have one writer uh, artist doing the whole book because it's his vision and it's exactly what he wants to put out there. So uh, I hope he can keep up with the, 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 the deadlines and everything and keep this going himself. But uh, we'll see what happens. The book is drawn really interesting. It feels like a passion project. Uh, the, the pages have a lot of detail. A lot of uh, little things that are done which feel like they have a lot of thought put into them. Just uh, behind each character on one panel there's a letter and it spells a word. Or the color palette is a really good choice. He uses just yellow, red, and black and white. And it, it makes this stark image. We have this blood moon type scene happening um, and it's it's a really cool neat looking book it's a piece of art really it feels like that uh, almost art uh, comic noir if you want to call it that uh, so basic storyline we kind of get a little bit of the back issue about how uh, Iron Fist got to where he was we see him as a child and his family searching for this mysterious place and sort of the crazy driven nature of his father and where that leads them as a family. And then we see him uh, on this sort of date interview with this dumb bimbo who honestly annoyed the crap out of me as I was reading her dialogue, so he succeeded in that. But, uh, and he just has no, nothing like that, it all feels monotonous to him and nothing fires him up until there's an attack and there's a fight and that wakes him up and it may, you see a lot more personality come out of him. Um, so and some really cool fight scenes. You really have to pay attention to the panels to see what's going on and to follow what's happening. But uh, really beautiful, really exciting. Uh, yeah, I think Andrews does a really good job using the images to tell a story. There's not a ton of dialogue in this book. Uh, the images really tell the story. The dialogue just sort of guides you along the path. It's sort of the breadcrumbs that lead you along the way. But it's the images that really, really tell the story, really drive it forward. Uh, the facial expressions, um, the the body movements, all those kind of things. So we have the beginning of a mystery, 
uh, a murder mystery. He's called back to, I guess, China, uh, to his real home, uh, and the messenger has been killed. So he's been attacked, the messenger has been killed, and he's called home. So we're going to see where it goes on that adventure. So looking forward to continuing the series. I think I might add it. 